All right, it's another time out on the program, Truth to Power, the program where we look at um, persecuted minority communities in Nigeria, and of course, we try our best to bring their stories to the fore and allow the whole world to know what's happening and how, of course, we can come out of this situation. My name is Ehis Agbon, and Truth to Power is proudly supported by Truth Nigeria, the media uh, website that guarantees you or that helps you to discover the truth about Nigeria. Today on the program Truth to Power, we shall be looking at a community in Kaduna that has been in the news for so long and it's almost become a, a recurring destiny when we are talking about headsmen attack or bandit attack or Fulani attack or terrorist attack, whichever nomenclature we use. By the time we talk about four, five, six um, communities, you must mention this community. I'm talking about Adara. Adara is in Kajuru local government area or Kajuru County in Kaduna State, Northwest Nigeria. You recall some years ago, this particular community was in the news because the head of that community or the king or the leader of that community was kidnapped by people that were later identified to be Fulani, uh, that was uh, identified to be from the Fulani tribe. So called the headsmen. But these days, how can you call someone without the head of country the headsman when he attacks a farmer? Well, that will be a story for another day. On Truth to Power today, we'll be looking at what happened in Adara, where some leaders were arrested by the former governor of Kaduna State. They were incarcerated, and we'll get to find out the outcome of that and what actually led to that arrest, what the outcome was, and where we are as of today. With me in the studio today, I have one of the leaders in that community that was arrested by the then governor Nasser Erufa of Kaduna State, and uh, he is out today. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Mr. Awemi Dio Mesamari. I don't know if I'll call you a chief, an elder, or how do we, what's the right nomenclature to address you properly, sir? It's just a mister. Okay, mister. But the one I, I, I really love most is the village headmaster. Good. <laughs> it's our privilege to meet the village headmaster. He is a leader in the Adara community and the person of Awemi Dio Mesamari. Welcome to Truth to Power. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll go into the program now, but first we'd like to have a little background. Tell us about the Adara people. Who are they? Where are they from? And where are they now? Oh, wow. Uh, the Adara people, uh, you know, uh, thanks to the, uh, what I call it, uh, the administration of uh, uh, Governor Ahmed Mohamed Makafi, mm. uh, which, uh, you know, started in, 20, I mean, in 1999, mm. when uh, we returned to democracy. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to become the revelation in Kaduna State of this uh, democratic dispensation mm. because when it came to power we were virtually an unknown entity in Kaduna State mm. but when he came to power and discovered what was actually on ground all of a sudden Adara community became the, the second largest chiefdom in Kaduna State after the Zezo Endre mm. with the second largest number of districts and district heads. Mm. So that in a summary tells you what has been going on long before now. Mm. That other people are the second largest you know, uh, ethnic group in Kaduna State, but they have been suppressed and oppressed and kept incognito until, you know, when uh, Makatari became, became the governor of Kaduna exactly. State. Exactly. Yeah. And since then, honestly, things were looking good until Governor Erfai came in and he was trying to undo what Governor McCarthy, you know, did. Hmm. And that's why we are having the crisis now. All right. Now, talking about Adara, people said the second largest ethnic group in Kaduna State. Where are they spread across? Tell, uh, give me an idea of the local government areas where we can find Adara people. Yes. Not dominantly, they are in Kajuru. Correct. Mm. Dominantly, they are in Kajuru and Kachia local government. Okay, they are also in, uh, some of them in Kachia local Correct. government. 
Okay. But besides that, we also have other people, a good number of them in Chukun, mm. in uh, Kangaroko local government, and of course across the uh, you know in Niger State, there are also two or three local governments wow. like uh, uh, Pai Koro, like mm. uh, Burara, and and things like that. Munya, these are local governments that you know other people are also found, mm. and they are indigenous to these local governments. Okay, before now. Before when McAfee identified the Adara people officially, giving them the, the respect that they deserve, were they, were they called Baggy or what, what were they called? <laughs> well, of course, we, we used to call us uh, the Kadara. Okay, yes, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but yeah. that is a name that was assigned you know, to, to us by, by the Hausa people. Okay. That is not our native name. Mm -hmm. Our native name is the Adara. And of course, we have since asserted that we don't want to be called Adara any longer. Because, Adara, you mean? Yes, I mean Kadara any longer. Because we are Adara people. Just like a lot of other ethnic groups in, in, the, in Southern Kaduna, the Bagi, they used to be called Gwari. Mm. The Boju used to be called Keje. Mm. And the Atia used to be called Kataf. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's a actually a case of a cultural imperialism where you try to assign, uh, you know, an identity to others. You, you, you don't go about, you know, giving names. We are not anybody's property. Mm -hmm. And so we should be identified by the name we have chosen for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, let's come to the issue why um, you had a press, uh, a, a media release last week that drew the attention of Truth Nigeria and some other persons to it. tell us about the incarceration of you and other leaders from the Adara community and when and why and how it happened. Well, uh, that, that is a long story, but uh, maybe I'll just have to find a way of cutting it short. Cutting it short and summarizing it. Uh, the, 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 the thing is that uh, we, we suddenly found ourselves, uh, you know, at the head of the storm when, uh, you know, uh, Governor Erufai came, uh, you know, on stage. And like I have already said earlier, he was trying to undo almost everything that previous administrations, including the military administrations, had done to kind of uh, stabilize uh, Kaduna State. You know, Kaduna State is a very volatile area. It's actually a microcosm of Nigeria as a whole, mm -hmm. with the northern part of it dominated by the House of Lani Muslims, and the southern part being predominantly Christian with a lot of tribes. That is how Nigeria is perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, a lot of historical injustice have been building up. There have been a lot of agitations, even since the, 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 the you know the, the colonial, uh, even the pre-colonial uh, you know period, when the natives were trying to resist the the Fulani jihad of uh, the early 19th century, mm -hmm. and so a lot of resistance have been going on. Of course, uh, you know, with the advantage they have of a lot of uh, external collections, uh, resources, and, and, and what have you, even democratic uh, advantages. They have, you know, but especially with the help of the colonial masters, masters. who, using the instrument of indirect rule, mm -hmm. actually subdued most tribes who had not earlier on been conquered by the, the jihadists. You know, jihadists. Mm -hmm. They gave us to them on a platter of gold. And that is what set the stage for what we are experiencing now. Mm. There is been a lot of agitation, a lot of resistance. And when uh, finally the last, uh, this the present democratic dispensation came in, yeah. honestly, there were concerted efforts to address most of these historical injustices. And we actually appreciate the then, you know, the, the government that came, you know, on the scene. Of course, they, they would not have done, they could not have undo everything that was done for so many years yeah. in such a, such a short period of time. But actually, hope was rising that indeed, gradually, things are going to be addressed. And that's when, uh, you know, uh, Nasser El Fai came on the scene and he was trying to undo everything that had already been done. Even if it was cosmetic, we appreciated it. Mm -hmm. And we felt all that needed was for subsequent administrations to build on no, 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 the momentum that was, yes. But unfortunately, we found a session to whoever. Somebody who does not even believe in justice. Mm -hmm. Because that is what I, how I can summarize 
the, the kind of temperament, the political, you know, uh, the ideology that was, you know, uh, on display. He doesn't believe in justice. All he knew was his own agenda, which was out, he was out to pursue with all people. So what, so what immediately led to the arrest of what your What immediately and led to the arrest is simply the case of attempts to scrap the other achievement. We saw the handwriting on But the what led to that? Because I know that there used to be a head or king or chief of Adara Kingdom that was kidnapped by um, Charles Kidnapped and eventually was killed. Yes, that is uh, led his Royal Highness uh, Dr. Raphael Mwadaga. Yes, yes, yes. Was because it was chief, chief of Adara Kingdom. Mm. Yes. Because it was after the death of that that actively there were attempts to change or if I'm not getting maybe there were a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes even, even before, before that. Yes. Okay. A lot. Okay, that may even have been the fallout of what was already going on exactly. at the background. Exactly. Okay. You see, even before you know he was killed, we were already aware of underground moves to change so many things. Even when he, I mean, they were there, there was this so-called restructuring of traditional um, institutions. Yeah, That's yeah. how he came under the guise of trying to restructure the traditional issues and bring back the their lost glory. Well, we didn't even have, they didn't even give us a... a, a not glory to be lost. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew something was fishy, uh, fishy along the line. And so he, he pretended to be a Democrat by you know, uh, calling for memos, setting up committees to listen to people, but all these were gimmicks. Okay. Because at the end of the day, all that the people say and wrote and submitted to government, they were just thrown to the you know trash bin, to the, 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 the trash can, mm. and the government just did what it wanted to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Yes. That is what happened. Mm. So all that he did was smoke screens to now find a way of justifying what he had already made up his mind to do. Otherwise, all the submissions, they rejected his plans, his ideas, and the names he was even planning to, you know, uh, give to kingdoms and like that, and forcing you to choose an alternative name. You have no complaint about the name you have, or your boundary, or whatever. And all of a sudden, you have been asked to choose or to make changes. You have been forced to make changes. To where you feel you are actually supposed to be. So that is what. And then the resistance started because during that process, committees were set up within uh, you know some of these children's like our own. Mm -hmm. The our our traditional ruler set up a committee. He said, Look, but you are asking me to do this is this children is not my personal property. Let me go ask my people. Oh, and we were very happy about that. He was and the committee was set up. A report was submitted, reaffirming all that we had on ground because all of it was submitted to previous government, to the previous government, and it was officially approved by the government. Mm. And so we felt there was no, no need for any change. But when the government, you know, started doing what we, you know, they, they felt they wanted to do without recourse to, the, you know, the, the views and wishes of the people. And then at the end of the day, they were saying that what you are doing was based on popular demand. Then it means you are let the cat out of the bag. So once we started resisting all those things, then we now started bringing out his farms. All those communities and individuals who were antagonistic or opposed or critical of what the government was trying to do became targets. But what's Particularly in our own case, mm. we uh, did a press, uh, you know, uh, yeah, press release. Yes, a press release stating the position of the community clearly mm. and rejecting all the changes. Of course, that press release actually came a few weeks after. The government had given us the writing, the uh, uh, you know apparent abrogation of uh, yeah, uh, the chief achievement. And you know we were give, given that information a week or two after the burial of the late Abu Madan. Mm. And on going through the content, we noticed that the actions, the legislation, yeah. were even taken several months earlier mm. when our king was still on the throne. 
And he just immediately told us that, okay, they have already concluded on what they wanted to do with us. But somebody was kind of blocking the chance and he had to be eliminated to clear room, the vacuum for them to do. And so we said, look, anybody looking at what is going on, if he has number six, he will understand that something is fishing somewhere. And that's when the crisis started. We now became targets and they were looking for us to arrest us for opposing and instigating people to rise against it. That was the beginning. Well, you say the claim that uh, the, the, their claims was that instigating people to 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 go against the government. But the government then said you guys were actively mobilizing and trying to, uh, to 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 trigger a breakdown of law and order, not only in Adaron, Adara Chibdom, but in the whole of Kaduna State as a whole. What do you say to that? Well, uh, I think that is uh, later when our you know uh, our civil the civil steps. We took, they ignored them because we did not do anything like uh, an uprising. Mm -hmm. We did not even do a demonstration, but we went to court okay. in January, I think 2018 or thereabout, to you know seek redress. But the government has surprised that since then until now, the case has not been heard. Hmm. Now, when it eventually got to a stage whereby, uh, the terrorists, after eliminating our, our traditional ruler and creating uh, so many ungoverned spaces in our community, they now step in by physically terrorizing our people and carrying out so many killings, abductions, and uh, you know uh, what do you call them, uh, kidnapping for ransom, even uh, you know direct arm robbery. All these things were going on. And that's when the people felt, look, if the government cannot protect us, we just have to do something to defend ourselves. That is when this so-called issue of uh, we mobilizing people to do this and that yeah. came in. But you don't have to mobilize anybody. Self-defense is like is is instinct, you know, instinctive. Every, it's anybody, in the constitution. Correct. It's clearly written. Before <laughs> right to self-defense. Sir, whether you even put it in the constitution or not, not. I can't it's, part of, it's, it's part, part of living part nature. Of not your human beings, no. animals, whatever is living. Yes. Has that instinct to self-defense. It is a recognition of that nature of man that this constitutional provision was now provided. So I'm saying even going back to that, whether you even say your constitution does not even allow me to defend myself, so, I will challenge that. Yeah. I will never abide by that constitution. Yeah. Who, which will now pave the way for my elimination, for my annihilation. I cannot respect such a constitution. Yeah. And so I am saying that at initial, by the laws of uh, natural justice, mm -hmm. everybody has the natural right to ensure his own personal survival, and his family and his community. And so, beginning from that, then cap it up with the constitutional provisions. We felt all those, uh, what, what the government said was, you know, bullshit. Because it meant that they themselves do not even believe in the constitution and do not even believe in our right to exist. Rather, they were creating an atmosphere whereby some outlaws will come and take over our life. Okay, so for how long were you and the other uh, leaders incarcerated? Yes, we were actually in my own case, it was the second time. Earlier okay. on, I had earlier been incarcerated in an, of course, it's, it's the same old story. You know, there were, you know, two massacres in uh, a town called Kasomaga in Kajibu Kankan. Yes. Right? The first one occurred, government didn't do anything. Then the second one occurred again. When the first one occurred, we protested, uh, you know, but nothing was done. Then the second one, it was organized on a market day. And the Kasuma Gemi market is the biggest market in our county, in our local government. Yeah. And so that was the day in which some elements organized a massacre and more than 200 people were killed on that day. Wow. One day on the market day. And so we said, look, if that is the situation, this market, you know, depends on our patronage. Yeah. All the goods that are brought from products and whatever. And of course, the patronage that the traders come to get is all from our people. Mm. So if our safety cannot even be guaranteed in, in, in that market, then we call on our people to boycott the market. That was what landed me in my first agitation. Okay. Yes. Mm. But it didn't last long. I think it was just about a week or less. But immediately, we were charged to go. 
I am the chairman of the Adelaide Women Association in Jeju mm -hmm. And for several months, we were attending court, trying to defend ourselves because they felt, you know, we, we, like you are claiming that we are trying to incite people uh, and this and that. So that was the first one. Then the second one is in relation to the massacres that Erufa himself orchestrated. He orchestrated them in the sense that, look, we are aware. Whenever anything happens and there are loss of lives, if you want to get the minimal, the most conservative, you know, figure of the people affected, mm -hmm. you normally rely on government reports because they are always reluctant to say everything because they fear that it may lead to. But this time around, it was the governor himself who was announcing to the world and inflating the figures and even mentioning the other, you know, tribe in particular as the perpetrators of the other. Yeah. While for so many years, the Fulani terrorists have been killing people and they have been saying that nobody should mention Fulani. And now here is a governor himself, the chief, the so called chief security of a state, now particularly mentioning a tribe and alleging that they have done this and that when there is no any security report that has actually come to establish that. Mm. And that is what now set the stage for various, so many other massacres. Mm. It was when the people rose to, 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 to defend themselves mm. and their families and their, you know, their land. And that is when we, the communities, who are now accused of the ones mobilizing and organizing the people. That is how it came about. Okay. But I am saying that all that happened were spontaneous, insistent reactions because these are human beings for God's sake. Mm. These are human beings. And so nobody should deny them that whether somebody goes there to teach them or not, they will naturally do that. So they don't have to find scapegoats. But they were always because it's part of the intimidation tactics to clear the way for the terrorists to do what they wanted to do. Hmm. Yes, you are listening to and watching Truth to Power, a program where we look at persecuted minority communities and most of the time Christian communities in Nigeria and also mostly northern and middle belt of Nigeria. And on the program today, I have uh, the village headmaster himself, Awemi Dio Meisamari, May 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 with me on the program. We've been looking at issues happening in and around the Adara community, his incarceration and of course incarceration of other leaders in his community and how they've been standing up against oppression and suppression from terrorists that identify as Fulani speaking tribes. Still talking about um, your community and what has been happening. It seems as if this problem does not seem to be going away anytime soon. And um, since your release, and uh, maybe you can also talk about one or two of the other elders whose businesses and means of livelihood were obviously affected by their incarceration. How have you and others, leaders in the community, been meeting up with your responsibility and surviving in general? Mm -hmm. That is a very serious question. The truth of the matter is that ever since our release, it has been tough. Mm -hmm. We were released on the, the 1st of May uh, 2019. I say it has been tough, and it, has, it is even getting tougher. Whether it is health wise, economically, politically, even socially. You see, the ramifications of what is going on and the effect on our people, particularly the, the any, any, anybody who is passionate, who is patriotic enough to try to stand for the people, is very, very serious. There are a lot of people who have compromised. Mm -hmm. When they saw the train coming, they felt that since they cannot stand it, they just have to join the train. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, they are the ones who are serving as the useful idiots. You know, picking uh, crumbs along the way. But those of us who feel we cannot, you know, go that low, it is getting tougher day by day. Some of us are there. Mm. Some are suffering health challenges. One of us is partially, you know, paralyzed. I am economically devastated because of what is, you know, uh, going on. I have even been sued by those, uh, you know, uh, uh, I am owing now. 
because I, I could not, I could no longer be able to meet up financially, you know, to my, you know, obligations. Even while I was, uh, or rather, we were in detention. Can I, can you, you be surprised to hear that? It is we, the community leaders who were in detention, that were taking care of our bills. Nobody could be able to help. Of course, there were a lot of people who were chipping in here and there. But essentially, we were still trying to meet up. And so that has been a lot, a lot of a very, very you know, big toll on us psychologically, emotionally, economically, even politically. The political one is even, even worse because because of the kind of uh, treatment we are receiving, mm. a lot of people have been intimidated. You know, the bottom line is that if you really want to you know, uh, solve social problems, you have to take care of your leadership. Yeah. If you don't take care of the leadership, it's not going to be easy. Mm. A few individuals, organizations, philanthropies, or whatever you, you know uh, they may be, or even religious you know, organizations, may only chip in here and there. Yeah. But solution to you know, social problems need good leadership. And that is what is actually lacking. And that is where the effects is being felt most. Because our leadership, community leadership, has been destroyed from the traditional to the political, even to the community leadership, like we who used to be president now, everybody is afraid. Because they, they saw the fact that they felt some of us who stood up. And so when the regional leaders are scared away, you have charlatans yeah. coming in to only worsen the situation. situation. And so because of that, our people used to resist, stand firm, to make sure that they are not overrun. Because of the encouragement and the support, that you know some of us were giving yeah. but now that everybody is already intimidated and people are afraid to venture into this they are the ones filling in the you know the vacuum being left now by people who are only there to get something out of you know the positions they are they are, they are, they are, they are in. so the effect has been devastating because the community has actually been you know destroyed it, including even the value system and, and whatever, educationally too. So many schools have been closed. Many villages have been deserted. Farmlands have been left, even if you farm. You that is why harvest. you are now going to... A lot of our people have been abducted from their farms. Particularly at harvest time, when they see you making a good harvest. They will just come and pick you and, and, and get, tell the rest to, you know... Dispose your pr exactly produce and pay for your ransom. So the effect is, is devastating and is even getting worse. Hmm. That is the problem. Alright, still looking at your uh, the, the community now and also knowing that these terrorists often come in, they deploy various means of terrorizing the communities and one that has become very popular is the abduction and rape of women. How bad is it? Abduction and rape. I can tell you the situation is even worse than it is. Wow. It's worse than it is than it is being reported. Wow. Much worse. Mm -hmm. And why? This is the situation. Mm -hmm. This issue of you know uh, turning women to sex slaves, sex slaves is it has been going on for a long time. Even before even, even before now. Wow including the wives of our religious leaders, the wives mm. of pastors. They were some of the people that suffered this faith first. That is several years, 2017, 2018. Mm. It has been going on for too long. You mean they deliberately target is the deliberate. wife of religious leaders? It is deliberate. It's just a way of trying to desecrate anything that has not got to do with Islam. Wow. That is it. And while they do that, they'll be taunting and mocking the people. Hmm. It, has, it is as bad as that. And it does, it, not, it does not even stop there. The savagery, the brutality meted out on all these you know, people abducted is something that we cannot you know, talk about here. The way they are treated there, and even if when they want to kill you, the way they kill you. Imagine, even after killing a person, you now tie his body to a motorcycle and you are driving along in a bush path. What for? What for? 
is that not insanity? So I'm telling you that what is going on, we cannot be, it's, it's too obscene to be talked about. Hmm. It is just slave enslavement is actually going on. Forced labor. Because in some places, these people even take over and actually have farms. And, and then they force the local people to be working for them. It's as, it's as bad as that. And so when you, do, well, it's rape, it's, it's one of the most outrageous things, but what of even dehumanizing people and denying them, you know, the dignity of their lives? What do we say about that? And so we feel, yes, we continue to mention some of these things, but I can tell you, nobody can describe what is happening. And the worst thing is that the security forces are aware of all these things. Really? They are. Mm. Security people are aware because the people tell them, including where they are. Do they have, do they have any, any uh, strike force or quick response units in and around the world? They have. Most of, them, has it been? We, we, you know, we, most of the time when they want to set up these kind of things, they are normally uh, located in you know a Muslim as of like the Muslim dominated communities. Okay. That is to provide immediate protection for, for them. them. While the elements who are actually committing these atrocities are also enjoying the protection of the security. Because mm. it is in their own communities that these are located. And when the attacks and atrocities are going on in the indigenous communities, communities. they say there is too far, there is no road. They will bring all kinds of excuses. It is only on some exceptional you know, situations or circumstances that they actually rise up to the education. Of course, we believe that they have the capacity. They can do it. Hmm. But I don't blame them. The problem is a political problem. Okay. It is. Hmm. We have a commander-in-chief. He's a politician. Isn't it? Yeah. He is the commander-in-chief of God's sake. Who commands and you know the, the person commanding refuses to obey the command and is left to go free. Do you blame the person who refuses to obey the order? You blame the commander. When the commander commands and what he commands is not done, what do you expect? He takes action. He takes action. And if he does that, if that is done, it will take care of his Everybody wants his job. Nobody wants to lose his job. Knowing that it is as bad as it is now, and uh, the fact that yes, everybody do have a right to redress. Now, looking at uh, redress mechanism that have been put in place by either the government or at the state level or at the national level, has there been any form of redress since we have a new administration now in Kaduna State where Kadara is? Are there signs of a change of attitude? Well, uh, that, that, I, I like that question because actually it was one of the motivations for the last, uh, you know, uh, statement Peace I did. Yes, yes. Yeah. I particularly talk about restitution. Yes. You see, a lot of injustice is going on to individuals, to groups, to communities, and even religions. But I can tell you, as I speak, I'm not aware of, okay, maybe I've heard of it, but just one case of a certain lawyer who took a fight to court and actually won a case asking for compensation of one thing that means for uh, of some sort. That was and that is a is a very reputable lawyer I had, you know, uh, you know, who did that. But I can tell you that countless number of individuals, including traditional rulers, have so much suffered so much injustice. And the capacity to seek redress is simply not there. Wow. You see, when people say you know, poverty has been weaponized. This is a practical manifestation. Justice is very expensive. Yes, please. It's very, very expensive. And so, when you cannot afford, you know, to pay, you don't get justice. It has been commercialized. And so, that is the main, the major problem. But it shouldn't, you know, uh, just stop at individuals. Even communities and other organizations should do so who are relatively better off. And you also see that happen. In my own case, yes, I have been arguing, I have been saying it, but a lot of the, the people feel that look, you can't fight government. But that is that is it doesn't make sense. If you can't fight them, you are telling them that they should continue with impunity. So any plan, and that any, any plans to sue the government from your side? Yes, I have already done so. Oh, great. I have. 
Certainly I have. I'm just waiting for a date now. Because what was done to us, the Adara 9, mm -hmm. is unjustifiable. Since the government itself confessed at the end of the day that we were not found in any way implicated. What we desire was, the minimum we desire was an apology. Yes. A written one for that matter. None was done. None. No thing like that, and there was no sign of any remorse, and the government had just continued. You know, it as, as, as if it never as, happened. As it never happened. Wow. Look, if you kill somebody's goat, uh, you say, ah, sorry, sorry, you maybe start saying, okay, no, what be chicken. A, a chicken. You know, start the the human beings are treated. Some of us even killed and, you know, maimed and whatever, and the government never bothers. No, we can't allow that to continue. All right. The program is true to power, and it's coming to you right here on the Truth to Power podcast. And this program is supported by Truth Nigeria. On the program, we look at persecuted minority communities in Nigeria. And of course, we try to bring their stories to the fore and see how we can get a solution to them. Before we wrap up the program today, we'd like to know, now that we are here and we have seen this situation and what first is your immediate and most important solution that you think the government, both at the state or federal, should bring in place to give some form of um, uh, resolution to all of these things that have happened to your, to your person and your people. Thank you. You see, I, I want to give you a, an example. Sometimes what you bring with late people may be very small, but it sends, it, it's just a matter of sending the correct signal. It's very, very important. You remember when um, President Barack Obama yeah. came you know, to power in America? Yeah. Before he came to, 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 you know, to be president, uh, America was already bogged down you know, in wars and conflicts around the world. Yeah. And the nation was already you know, fed up with that kind of atmosphere. Suddenly, here was Barack Obama. Do you know that he won the Nobel Peace Prize before he even took any action? I'm sure you are aware of that. Yes, yes. Why? The signal, the message he sent calmed a lot of nerves. Yes, yes. It created a different atmosphere in which people knew that it was not the business as usual. Sure. That is what we wanted. At least the government, the new government at the federal and the state yeah. level should have made that very, very clear. That look, we are here to do something different. And I'm afraid we have not seen that. We haven't seen it. Of course, when you do that, you of course now follow it with action. action. But action, take, it takes time to mature for people to actually see. But before it gets to the action part, let us get a clear signal, a clear message that look, you don't belong to the old school. You Your body like, language you, exactly. should show. It should show clearly. But we are not seeing that. Okay. Certainly we are not seeing that. But it may not be as, uh, you know, bad as it was, but the truth is that Nigerians, particularly we in Adela people, we expected much more. The most symbolic thing it's simple, it's just symbolic. Because, yes, we need our children. But our primary ruler has already been killed. He cannot be brought back. The most symbolic thing is government should apologize for what it did and take steps to reverse it. That is as if it will not put bread on my table, it will not do it. But I can tell that will go a wrong way. And there are so many other individuals, groups, and organizations and communities who also suffer a lot of injustice. If government can just do that gesture, it will set you know, a different tone you know, for us to now hope for better days. We haven't seen that. Yet. And better days indeed, we are hoping for. And what will be your parting shot as we leave the program now? My parting shot is not going to be just limited to our immediate environment okay. because we're actually not operating in a vacuum. Yeah. You see, we are in a war in which black people, the black race, is not doing justice to itself. Mm -hmm. Particularly the leadership of the black race. Mm -hmm. We have a serious leadership problem. 
at the national, at the, at the international level yeah. than the mm-hmm. standard. But if you even come to the, you know, a state level or national, you know, level, it's even worse in the case of Nigeria. Nigeria. And of course, since we are partakers in a, a national environment, when things are so bad there, so definitely trickle down. To trickle down, and that is what is happening. And so my parting shot is that if we want to regain our dignity, we blacks like you know to live on past glory. Yes, blacks had a glorious past, but that is no longer. It cannot. It cannot take care of us now. We need to reinvent ourselves, and it must start with our leadership class. If our leadership class does not start, we started at the bottom. Is asking for a, I mean, a revolution, and unfortunately, the world system is no longer available for a revolution. Exactly. And that is why we have no other option than for our leadership class to sit up and do something. So, thank you so very much, yes. Mr. The Village Headmaster, Mr. Awemi Dio Mes Samari, for having time to be on Truth to Power today. It has been quite a privilege and a pleasure. All right, yes, that's about the size of the program today. Hoping that we have been able to bring all of these issues to the fore and of course make you have a better and clearer understanding of what these issues are. Truth to Power is a program that is designed to highlight happenings in and around persecuted minority communities, most of the time Christian communities in Nigeria. And on the program, we try our best to also provide solutions. Until next time when we'll be on again, I'd like to let you know that you can be a part of this program by joining us on Truth to Power podcast, visiting Truth Nigeria website, and also supporting what we do. You can go to Truth Nigeria at truthnigeria.com. And together, let's keep moving. My name is Ehis Abon. Until next time, like always, I would say, plant a tree today, water it, and watch it grow. May the good mighty Lord bless and keep us all. We'll meet some other time. Are you seeking the truth about Nigeria? Do you want a reliable source for unbiased news and insightful analysis? Then look no further, cause Truth Nigeria got you covered. Explore truthnigeria.com for real stories that matter, ranging from governance to international politics. Uncover the reality behind the headlines. Truth Nigeria, where facts meet clarity. Discover the truth about Nigeria today. Visit truthnigeria.com now. Thank you.